Welcome to News Talk with Simone Ivani at the International News Channel. Internationally, many groups and individuals are still advocating and fighting for their basic human rights. One such group are the Tibetans. In a fight that has lasted years, Tibetans are asking for autonomy from the People's Republic of China. Many might think that the Canadian government, who claims to support the achievement of human rights, would support such a cause. However, Tibetan activists say that this is not the case. To discuss Canada's response to the Tibetan cause, we are joined today by Anvesh Jain. Anvesh Jain is a research associate with the Canada-Tibet Committee. Thank you for joining me, Avnesh, today. Happy to be here. To begin, can you tell us more about what Tibetans around the world are advocating for as of right now? As of now, the Tibetans around the world are supporting His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his central Tibetan administration. It's a democratic institution that they've built. It's based out of Dharamshala in India, but it operates elections. It has representatives all around the world, like any other government would. Right now, what they are advocating for are human rights for Tibetans, both in the diaspora, but especially for those who are still trapped on the Tibetan plateau, facing intense levels of repression from the Chinese state day in and day out. I mean, based on their language rights, their cultural rights, their religious rights, and their freedoms are under attack and under threat every single day. So that's one thing that they're advocating for. Another thing that they're advocating for, and this has been a big focus of the administration, is the middle way approach. And what that means is uh, reaching a compromise with China, a negotiated compromise that facilitates for the genuine autonomy of Tibetans within the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe the relationship between Tibet and the People's Republic of China? So historically, Tibet was an independent country. Uh, it, throughout, you know, from the 700s, 800s onwards, Tibet had its own history, its own empire, uh, and the relationship with China kind of waxed and waned over the years. But the important thing to remember is that fundamentally, Tibet was separate and it was an independent country under international law. This was especially apparent uh, between 1913 and 1950, when it was really just fully an independent country. It had no formal or informal relationship with China, which was under a civil war at the time. And then suddenly in 1949, when the Chinese Civil War ended, they turned and they invaded and occupied Tibet. So mm -hmm. that's when the relationship really uh, took a turn for the worse. And in the last seven decades since the occupation of this historically independent country under international law, uh, you've seen the situation only get worse and worse for Tibetans in the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. Even just in the last year, I think 500,000 Tibetans on the plateau have been undergoing forced internment uh, in China. And this is something that isn't talked about. Uh, since 2008, I believe over 150 Tibet Tibetans have gone to the extreme step of self-immolation because this is how uh, mm -hmm. much despair they are feeling in, in Tibet. And this is the kinds of protests that they're only allowed to do because they can't protest in any other way. If they try to protest in any other way, they are jailed, and their family is punished. Nowadays, what they're trying to do is see if any Tibetans in Tibet have family outside of Tibet to try to monitor that and to use that as pressure and leverage on Tibetans within Tibet. So the situation is quite dire, and the relationship between Tibet and China is is not, everything is not well, even though the Chinese government would like for us to believe otherwise. What is the white paper that China has issued on Tibet, and what are its implications? So one of the things you have to remember is that the People's Republic of China is very much concerned with the politics of legitimacy and recognition. It wants to be recognized as uh, the legitimate uh, guarantor of Tibet. It wants to be seen as the one that is actually in control of Tibet, culturally and politically, even though uh, if you ask any Tibetans, even in Tibet or in the diaspora especially, we know this to not be true. It's kind of just a, a false mirage. So what the white paper was trying to do, they released it in uh, on May 23rd, 2021, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. It was timed with the um, anniversary of the 17-point agreement signed in 1951, under occupation, under gunpoint, uh, by the representatives of the central, of the Tibetan government at the time, with the invading armies of China, and basically it established the rules of engagement for how Tibet would come under Chinese control. It guaranteed cultural autonomy, it guaranteed a framework that Tibet would continue to exist uh, as an independent or autonomous zone with its own institutions, its own government. Uh, they would respect the laws of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the kind of traditional Tibetan way of life. But over the next few years, that didn't pan out. Uh, you continually saw that the Chinese began encroaching on mm -hmm. the rights that were set out within this 17-point agreement, or so-called 17-point agreement. I think agreement is a bit of a misnomer when it was signed at gunpoint. Uh, and then by 1959, the Tibetans realized that the Chinese were not going to hold up their end of the bargain, and they fled to India, uh, and they established their government in exile there. 
So what the white paper was trying to do is essentially is to shore up Chinese legitimacy over Tibet. It was trying to say to the world that Tibet is in China, that we've respected Tibetan rights, cultural, linguistic, religious, all of these things, that we've facilitated development in Tibet. One of the things they always like to say is that Tibet was a, a serfdom, it was a kind of theocratic and feudal society before China came along and they liberated them and they modernized the Tibetans, but we know this to not be the case. It was a forced modernization and the kind of development that you are seeing in Tibet today, the economic development is not by Tibetans, it is not for Tibetans, it is by the Chinese and it is for the, Thai, uh, for the Chinese in an attempt to kind of sceneize the Tibetan people, eliminate their culture, eliminate their language, eliminate and extinguish their heritage. Mm -hmm. So switching gears a bit, just recently the House of Commons opposed the June 22nd motion on Tibet. Can you tell us a bit more about the motion? Mm -hmm. Yes, this was a uh, particularly shocking and a bit disappointing to us. So let me tell you a little bit about the motion itself. The motion was very simple. It called for dialogue. Uh, it's called that the Canadian government, the House of Commons, support dialogue between representatives of the Tibetan people, uh, the central Tibetan administration, for example, and the government of the People's Republic of China in reaching a better solutions for Tibet. Because we have to remember that when we're talking about all of this stuff, even uh, those of us uh, in the diaspora, those in the Tibetan diaspora, we always have to center the voices of Tibetans and those especially who are still existing under such unmitigated repression in Tibet today. It's important that we keep in mind that whatever we do, whether it's pushing for independence, whether it's pushing for autonomy, whether it's pushing for a negotiated compromise, it has to keep in mind the interests and the rights of those who are still suffering under such repression day in and day out. So this is what the, the, the motion was trying to do. It was trying to get them simply back to the negotiating table so maybe we could have some progress on this conflict that has been frozen now for over second, seven decades. There's been a new urgency on the side of the Tibetans, uh, especially because they recently had an election for their Sikyong or their president of the Central Tibetan Administration. Uh, the new one is Penpa Sering, and his goal is to reach that middle way approach to uh, have this compromise and negotiation with the People's Republic of China and to hopefully get a better deal uh, for Tibetans who are still living under such immense uh, repression. So the motion was essentially calling to support that process of dialogue. Uh, you mentioned it was disappointing, but what was your reaction to the fact that there was not a unanimous consent for the motion? Hmm. So we were quite surprised. Uh, the way it works in our Canadian parliamentary system is that a motion needs unanimous consent for it to be passed by the House. Even if one uh, member of parliament votes it down, then it's gone. It's gone from the agenda. You move on. So we were quite surprised because uh, this motion has been in the works for over a year. It received unanimous approval from the Special Committee on Canada-China Relations back in 2020, which is one composed of people from all different political parties. It, it's really dedicated to examining uh, the Canada-China relationship. And this was one of the recommendations, one of the recommended motions that came out of it. It's received support from Ambassador Dominic Barton of Canada to China for mm -hmm. what he's testified on Tibet issues before the Special Committee on Canada-China Relations. We've identified a need for this kind of motion for a while now. Uh, even other countries, other parliaments have established some kind of support for this motion. I believe that Sino-Tibetan dialogue has got, gotten the support of the European, Italian, Dutch parliaments, the European Commission, the United States State Department, the White House under President George W. Bush, and mm -hmm. the German Green Party. So uh, this is not a controversial motion. It was not designed to be. It was not designed to rile anybody up. It was simply meant to say that Canada continues to support this process of dialogue and diplomacy, and we believe that Canada has a special role to play and can serve as a special example, especially given that we have regional autonomy within our own borders. If you look at uh, Quebec, that's an example of a nation existing within a nation in a lot of ways. So essentially, we were, we were kind of shocked because we had gone and we had lobbied. Uh, Tibetan groups had come together across the country from coast to mm -hmm. coast to talk to their members of parliament to get this motion and this agenda on board uh, in parliament. And, and then suddenly we got the news that uh, it had been voted down or it hadn't passed unanimously. And we were kind of stumped as to why that happened. Mm -hmm. How does this particular motion fit into the general response by the Canadian government to support Tibet? Yeah, so essentially uh, this motion would have been following on from a 2007 motion that expressed pretty similar inclinations. It was introduced by the New Democratic Party member of parliament, Peggy Nash, back in 2007, and it was calling for something pretty similar. The reason we felt the need to push for a new motion now 13, 14 years later is because the last time that there was any dialogue between uh, between Tibetans and the People's Republic of China was in 2010. And the situation has changed so much since then. Uh, 
even with the new administration of the Central Tibetan administration, even with all these changes that we've been observing in the last 11 years, there hasn't been any push for dialogue. I think it speaks to the confidence of the Chinese. I think that they think that they have the upper hand. I think that they think that they don't need dialogue. And that's why it's important for governments like Canada's, like the Europeans, like the United States to come together and say, no, look, human rights is important. You've agreed to maintain this kind of special autonomy for the Tibetans. This is in your own words in the 17 point agreement from 1951 that you're kind of flaunting now in your white paper. But if you look at all the promises made, they've all been broken. You haven't lived up to any of them. So it's time for dialogue. It's time for diplomacy and it's time for negotiation. I think the Chinese think that they are in quite the upper hand and they don't need to do any of that. So it's important that governments like ours make that push and demonstrate that support for Tibetans to continue that struggle, to continue that push for a negotiated compromise. Mm -hmm. No, I hear you. But taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, how has the Canadian government handled the Tibetan cause compared to other countries? Sure, I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. It depends on what time period you're examining. So I actually have a paper coming out in December on the Canadian response to the initial invasion and occupation. Mm -hmm. And what I've observed and what we've been observing over the last seven decades is that uh, Canada's initial response, uh, even Lester B. Pearson, who later, he was uh, a Secretary of State for Etern External Affairs at the time, but then he later went on to famously become Prime Minister and win the Nobel mm -hmm. Peace Prize, as we, as we know, as we talk about a lot in Canada. Even he has a statement from 1950, 1951 that says, under international law, I am confident that Tibet qualifies as its own sovereign state, its own nation. So you're seeing this kind of high rhetoric, high dialogue from the 1950s uh, after the initial invasion. And over the years, what you're seeing is a kind of watering down of that rhetoric. You're seeing that Canada is slowly stepping away from those commitments, stepping away from those ideas and ideals. In 1970, Canada recognized the People's Republic of China, and as a result, the Tibetan issue kind of had to be put onto the back burner, forced onto the back burner, mm. uh, as a result of opening up, you know, the economy of China and these political relations that Canada was trying to cultivate with the Chinese government. And over time, unfortunately, what you were seeing is that there's a steady deterioration of support for Tibet, even from the 1990s when His Holiness the Dalai Lama was uh, granted an honorary citizenship of Canada, to now when he's not even invited to Canada, he's barely... Uh, been mentioned by the prime minister, by the current government. So unfortunately, what you are seeing, regardless of political party, and this is something I want to stress, is that yes, we are disappointed in what's happening currently with the current government, but we can't place the blame solely on them because there have been liberal governments, there have been conservative governments. Unfortunately, it's a pan-Canadian problem that we are witnessing this kind of steady deterioration of support for Tibet from what was once really a, a principled and um, traditional commitment that Canada had towards the Tibetan people. Well, you stated publicly in your article that the Liberal government particularly has abandoned Tibetans. So can you tell me a bit more about why you take that stance? Sure, and I think the reason we have to uh, point out the Liberal government in particular is one, because of that motion that did fail, and we were quite mm -hmm. surprised and shocked as to why it failed. And also simply because they are the government in time, uh, currently in power. So the way Canadian foreign policy works, the way uh, the Canadian parliamentary system works, is the government has complete authority over matters of foreign affairs, over political relations with other countries in the external realm. So uh, it doesn't matter what the opposition says. I mean, it's good that the opposition supports certain endeavors, but really when it comes down to it, it's the government, it's the cabinet that is making these decisions. And we want to make sure that the cabinet understands that we are witnessing this kind of silence on Tibet that has reigned for the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. We are seeing that Tibet gets no mention from the top of Canada. We're seeing that um, there is support in other matters, but there seems to be a very real hesitancy to talk about political affairs. There seems to be a real hesitancy to talk about human rights affairs when it comes to Tibetans uh, that we are witnessing perhaps because the Canadian government feels the need to leverage or balance its relations with the Chinese government. And this is mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons we had to just ask. We were wondering why have, are we witnessing this abandonment by the current government and what can we do to rectify it? Right. In your opinion, which politicians and or political parties do you hold responsible for the shift in Canadian policy towards the dependent cause? Uh, I don't think uh, you can really pinpoint it to one party in general. Yeah. I think what you have to look at is the steady deterioration over time. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, even if you want to go and look at both parties, Prime Minister Stephen Harper did meet with the Dalai Lama when he was Prime Minister before him, Prime Minister Paul Martin met with the Dalai Lama when he was yeah. Prime Minister. Right. Liberals and conservatives have come together time and time again to support the Tibetan cause because it goes beyond partisan politics. It's about supporting democracy, it's about supporting human rights, and it's about supporting 
a people who has been, uh, you know, in a similar historical circumstances in Canada, who support democratic institutions and who want their own self-determination, sovereignty, and freedom. These are principles that Canada has always abided by in its foreign policy, and it's time to ask why we are stepping away from those traditional commitments. It's not Canadian uh, to just walk away from the people who are in need. And what we're seeing over the past, you know, decade or two is that that's what we are, have been doing, very unfortunately. And, uh, you know, conservatives have been in power. They haven't necessarily walked back the trend. Liberals have been in power. The situation has deteriorated. So in my estimation, it's a pan-Canadian problem. I don't want to point mm-hmm. blame on any particular political party or politician because really, like, we've talked to so many different politicians about this issue over uh, the last year, over the last few weeks, we were trying to get this motion passed. And we got this support from liberals, from new Democrats, from conservatives. You have to remember that the motion was approved unanimously in the Special Committee on Canada-China Relations. But then when it came to making it a matter of government policy, when it came to announcing this policy to the whole world, that's when we're seeing uh, the Liberal Party step back. And they're currently in charge. So that's where I think, unfortunately, the critique has to, the blame has to be placed. Do you think that the Canadian government is hesitant to stand in solidarity with Tibet? So I, I think uh, publicly uh, there is some hesitancy to s- make these statements about Tibet, to declare, to very, uh, you know, publicly make these announcements, like what you were seeing in India with Prime Minister Modi wishing the Dalai Lama happy birthday publicly. This was a big step, a big shift in India's Tibet policy. In the, in the United States, you are seeing them consistently meeting with representatives of the Tibetan central Tibetan administration. Just this week, there was a meeting between the United States, India, and representatives of the CTA, the central Tibetan administration. So you aren't seeing similar rhetoric or similar uh, public displays of policy from Canada. I'm not going to say that Canada hasn't been supporting Tibet. This is a, That would be incorrect. Mm-hmm. There have been many initiatives that the Canadian government has been supporting in terms of education rights, linguistic rights. If you look at uh, exile communities around, especially India and Nepal, the Canadian government is doing a lot of important work in funding those schools, making sure that Tibetan kids know their history, know their mm-hmm. language, know their heritage, and are able to com- compete and thrive in a modern economy. So these kinds of soft skills or, or human security issues are important. I'm not going to uh, say they aren't. The Canadian government has accepted many Tibetan refugees over the years to the point that the community is now over 10,000 uh, Tibetan Canadians and growing stronger. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in July, they celebrated Tibetan Heritage Month in Ontario. So I can't say that from official Canada, there has been no support or it's been complete negligence. Okay. But what we are seeing is more of a hesitance to talk about the political aspect, mm-hmm. to talk about the human rights aspect, to challenge China on international forums directly. And I think there might be a couple of different reasons for in that, what more do you think the Canadian government should be doing to actually support them then? I think there's a few things that the Canadian government can be doing, and it's not, a, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. In fact, a lot of our allies, a lot of our near peer countries have been doing things that uh, we could probably take a, 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 a leaf or a page out of their book. I, I know India, the United States, a lot of European countries, countries that we would consider our allies in democracy and human rights, especially in the foreign policy realm have been taking certain steps that Canada should learn from. I think in the United States, in the same time period that we're talking about, just in the last two, three years, there was the uh, Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, Mm -hmm. and there was the the landmark Tibet Policy and Support Act of 2019. And even now, the Biden administration, you are seeing them consistently mention Tibet, bring up Tibet, and recognize Tibet as a strategic, strategic and human rights issue that they are abiding by. I do also have a few specific recommendations that us at the Canada Tibet Committee have been pushing for over the years. So these are some things that the Canadian government might want to consider. Mm -hmm. So one of them was the adoption of this motion in support of dialogue between the representatives of the Tibetan people and representatives of the Chinese government. Another was a call for unrestricted reciprocal access to cultural Tibet for diplomats, parliamentarians, researchers, and journalists. Mm -hmm. A call on Canada to support an independent fact-finding mission to investigate the human rights situation in Tibet, including reports of coercive labor, surveillance and re-education, the resettlement of nomadic pastoralists, and the status of linguistic cultural rights and religious freedoms. And to look into the recent closure of the US consulate in Chengdu, which would have been the closest one to Tibet, the persistent need for information gathering by democratic countries, and the recommendation that Canada transfer a third staff person to the Canadian Trade Office in Chengdu with a specific mandate to monitor the situation in Tibet. Because what we are seeing by members of uh, Global Affairs Canada, by parts of the ambassador and the diplomatic class, whenever they talk about Tibet uh, in Canada, they say that we don't have enough information, we don't have 
proper access to Tibet because it's at a highly restricted place. Uh, and the media freedoms are essentially non-existent. It is one of the most, uh, it is the least free country in the world, ranked consistently year after year by a freedom house. Uh, and so information gathering is something that we can work on as well. And these are all mm -hmm. relatively simple things. I think the path has been laid and pioneered by other democratic allies. So it's more about not reinventing the wheel, not really going out and creating this bold Canadian policy of Tibet, but rather keeping in lockstep with our closest friends and allies on this issue that is important and it is of our critical interest. No, that's absolutely fair. Given the fact that China has received a great deal of international scrutiny for the situation in Xinjiang, as well as the situation in Hong Kong, why do you think that this scrutiny has not been extended to Tibet? Right. I think that's a very good question. Uh, we've identified, I think, three main reasons behind the relatively less international scrutiny for the situation in Tibet. The first one is a lack of information coming out from Tibet. So this is what we just talked about. Freedom House consistently ranks Tibet as the least free country in the world, ranking it on the same level as Syria in its annual human rights reports. Mm -hmm. uh, reporters with reporters have stated that it is more difficult to get access to Tibet than to get access to North Korea. <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a minute. So yeah, no, one, the level of information that we are getting is, is very difficult, first of all, so we don't fully know what's happening in Tibet so that we can talk about it in the international human rights view. The second reason is the nature of the repression itself. The nature of repression in Tibet seems to be designed to create confusion among local Tibetans as well as international observers. Different provinces and prefectures in Tibet seem to have different styles of policies without any common pattern of policies that one can point to and readily identify. The scale of imprisonment camps for forced ideological trainings do not seem to be as large as those in East Turkestan or Xinjiang, as you've mentioned. And the sophistication and crisscross of these discriminatory policies using really advanced, sophisticated technological means of repression make it very difficult for international observers to point out a common pattern of human rights discrimination. And finally, the third reason I would mention is the duration of the Tibetan movement. The Tibetan movement itself kind of peaked in the 1980s and 1990s, especially when the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and because the movement has been in the public consciousness for so long, because it's been a 70 year movement, because it peaked in the 1970s and 1980s, which if you can believe it, is already 40 to 50 years ago, because of the movement's length and duration, which is one, a testament, I think, to Tibetan people. But unfortunately, when something goes on for so long, it tends to lose um, the spotlight. It tends not to have the same shine in the international consciousness or the global human rights consciousness. So in your opinion, why should Canadians care about the Tibetan cause? I think that's a really good question, and I think it's something that all Canadians should introspect about. Do Canadians care about human rights? Do you care about the religious freedoms and cultural rights of others? Do you believe that others have a right to go about their day, to practice their traditions, to learn their history, to go to their temples, their mosques, whatever, and be able to practice their faith as they believe in, that they have the right to speak out? that they believe that they have a role, they have a place in determining the future of their governments, uh, of their country. If you believe in these things, if you believe in democracy, if you believe in constitutionalism, if you believe in self-determination for different national and ethnic groups, then you should be a believer in the Tibetan struggle. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's, it's a very noble cause, especially given the nature of the nonviolence. This is something that has been pointed out time and time again. Yeah. The Tibetan struggle was not a violent one. For the last seven decades, one of the reasons it has been so remarkably durable is because of the Tibetan commitment to nonviolence, to uh, negotiation, to dialogue, and to compromise without ever giving up their identity, without ever giving up their heritage, which is something, it's the kind of information warfare that China is trying to impose on them. Uh, there's a really good quote that I, I always go back to, which is that the struggle of uh, man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And that is the kind of struggle that Tibetans are in right now. They're in a struggle of remembering who they are, remembering their identity, remembering their history as an independent nation. And it is the forgetting that the People's Republic of China is trying to impose on them. They're trying to make them forget who they are, where they come from, and what they believe in. And Tibetans, year after year, day after day, despite all the repression, despite the intense nature of the uh, discrimination that they are faced, mm -hmm. are experiencing every single day, they do not forget who they are and they make sure that the global community knows and is there to stand up for their cause when we are ready to accept that. Mm -hmm. So I think that part of uh, the duty of every Canadian who believes in these ideals, who believes in these principles, 
and who believes that Tibet, the Tibetans have a point to make not only about how small nations are treated in that part of the world, but everywhere. They're, the rights of international law and international communities, I think that we can put a lot more pressure on our government, on all of our representatives, mm -hmm. to take a leaf out of the Tibetan playbook and support the Tibetan cause. Mm -hmm. So what do you think Canadians can do to better support that cause? Well, there are a lot of organizations like the Canada Tibet Committee, I'll plug my own here, uh, that are doing this kind of work. We are reaching out to representatives in the Canadian government. Every year we have lobby days, we talk to these people, and really the average person can do a lot just by using their voice, just by using maybe social media, following different organizations, learning, educating yourself about the history of the Tibetan struggle, not believing the kind of propaganda that is coming out of the People's Republic of China. At the very least, take it with many, many grains of salt. Do your own research, do your own reading, understand why we're here, why are we talking about these issues, and how does it matter to Canada today? Because I really think that Tibet is not some issue that is dead and buried in the past. It is not something that is uh, old history. It is something that is today. It is something that is present, and it is something that matters to Canadians. Mm -hmm. There are 10,000 uh, Canadians of Tibetan origin now residing in Canada. A lot of them are in the Little Tibet community, Parkdale High Park community in Toronto. You've probably yeah. eaten at a Tibetan restaurant, or, or many of us, especially, I mean, I'm from an Indian background, we love our momos in Delhi. We do. So we absolutely do. If you have, if you've engaged in any of this stuff, you are engaging with yeah. Tibetan culture. No. And I think uh, maintaining that engagement, educating oneself, talking to Tibetans, and going out, and if you have the time and energy to do so, get in touch with these organizations. Get in touch, send the Canada Tibet Committee an email. Get on our email list. Uh, see what you can do, uh, sign uh, letters, petitions, talk to your MPs about these issues. If this mm -hmm. is something you care about, this is something they should care about too. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. And thank you so much for joining us, Amnesty. It was an absolute pleasure. It was my pleasure being here. Thank you to our viewers for tuning in. You're watching the International News Channel on Tag TV. I am Simone Ivani. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the bell notifications to stay up to date on our latest videos.